Good morning, church. And uh, welcome. I'd like to welcome you all this morning to Community Church of Vincennes. We hope that worship will be meaningful to you, whether you're in your pew or uh, watching from home or traveling this morning. So we'd like to welcome everybody this morning. One key announcement from that I need to highlight from the bulletin. The safe sexuary training will be held in the fellowship hall next Sunday, January 22nd, immediately following worship. Anyone that works in any capacity with the children and youth must attend this training. Uh, we'll need, need to see Cheryl for any questions. She's assured me it's just a short renewal course, take five to six minutes. But very important that everyone be there if you work in any capacity with youth or children. So that's next Sunday, immediately following worship. I think that's all I'm going to need to highlight, so let's worship the Lord. Good morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Good morning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is a beautiful day, Lord, that you have created. We will rejoice. We will be glad in it. And we thank you, Father, for bringing us here this morning. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to set aside anything that would distract us today that we might hear from you. We know, Lord, that what we put in, we know you're going to give us so much more. So help us, Father, to be attentive to you this day and the message you have for each and every one of us. To you we give the praise and the glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> if you would uh, stand as you are able, we are going to sing a couple of songs this morning to start Glory to His Name. And after that will be Jesus paid it all. Savior's feet, 
The service for our joys and concerns. Good list again this morning. Nelda Frederick, the widow of the late Harold Preach Frederick, former pastor emeritus, passed away on November 4th, 2022. Details of service and donations are in the bulletin on the bulletin board outside Susie's office. Joyce Henry was taken from the service last Sunday to the ER. Tests were run and she was able to be discharged to her home where she has been recovering this week. John Hedge fell at home and was taken to Good Sam and transferred to Deaconess Midtown in Evansville for seven staples. He was kept overnight and returned home on Tuesday where he is recovering. He's also out preaching today. Oh, well. Yeah, so he's, do, he's doing well. He's doing well. Yeah, he's preaching today. So good for John. Robert Ridgely, Judy Duell's grandson, had sinus surgery and is recovering at home. Sandy Stewart got a good report from her recent test. No cancer. Praise the Lord. Jim Bobe is home after a surgical procedure um, this past Wednesday morning, recovering at home. Nancy Stater asked for prayers for a young lady who has been diagnosed with breast cancer, which has spread throughout her body. Noreen Schwarzentruber has requested prayer for her niece, Rhonda Fox, who is in medically induced coma due to uncontrolled seizures, and for her Aunt Catherine, and family in Florida as she was diagnosed with stage four liver cancer. Mm. Colleen Tolliver is recovering at home after a stay at Good Samaritan Hospital. Tammy Mitchell, a new attendee here at church, is preparing for a possible future lung transplant. So we'll keep Tammy in our prayers. Any other joys or concerns at this time. Please pray with me. <clears throat> Glory to your name, O oh God. You paid it all, all to you we owe. Sin has left a crimson stain and you washed it white as snow. As we sing these words, let us hear these words and to hear your call. We are reminded that darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. We pray for your compassion and healing for those individuals in our congregation that need it. We pray for your comfort and presence for those who are grieving and loving. We thank you for your unending love when we don't deserve it. 
Guide us, please, Lord, to always put you first. Help us to be your servants, willing to do your work, to offer care, provide presence, and share your love. And now we lift up the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Now let us prepare our hearts as we give unto the Lord of our gifts, our tithes, our offerings, and as always, ourselves. <laughs> let this be the prayer of our hearts as the offering is being taken. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so blessed by the great bounty with which you have filled our lives. Bless and multiply, Lord, this offering to your service, to the building of your kingdom, as we freely and joyfully give unto you. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen and amen. And as you are seated, if the children would like to come on down now, Miss Cheryl's got a little something to share with you today. Well, good morning, beautiful children of God. How's everybody today? Good. All right. So, any of you guys know who this might be? <coughs> Anybody? Yeah. <gasps> You're very smart. Yes, it is. This is actually me as a baby. I was, uh, let's see, mother, my mother dated. My mother dated things. Unlike all of us, we don't usually date things much, do we? Yep, I was 12 weeks old. Do I still look like this? Uh, no. Kind of. Oh, you are a blessing. <laughs> Hell, he is going to make somebody a wonderful husband. You are a sweetheart. Yes. Well, I, yes, I guess I do. Do I look like that a little bit? Just a lot older, huh? Yeah. Oh, well, th no, I don't look like it or I'm not a lot older? You don't look like it. Okay. Well, and that happens too. I kind of do, yeah. All right, so I've changed a little bit, haven't I? Yeah. 
Okay. Why well, this one? I love this one. Anybody know who this is? You guys know who this is? No, that is not me. Anybody know? Who is it? It is Pastor Darren. Can you all see this? Look how cute he is. Fourth grade. Isn't he adorable? Isn't he adorable? Oh. <laughs> and I actually looked at this and had to look again because this actually looks so much like our grandson Canaan does now. So anyways, yes. Now, Pastor Darren look exactly like this now? The ears are kind of the same. Good ears kid. are kind of the same. But does he look exactly like this? No. no. And I bet he doesn't fit into this shirt anymore. Although he has some clothes that he's had a very long time, I don't think he can fit in this shirt anymore. Would you agree? Yeah. So he doesn't. So we, these are pictures from us from a very long time ago. And while you can kind of tell who we are, we don't look like this now because we've changed. Okay? So even you as babies grew to where you are now. And everybody out there has grown into kind of a different person, right? So we know we change as people. Tell me some other things that change. What else changes? Daniel. Animals, Animals do change. Yeah, they are babies and then they get bigger. Everett? Orcas. orcas. Why would I know that you would say orcas? Because they're your favorite? Animal. Yes, they are your favorite animal. I do know that. Yes. Okay, besides animals, what else changes? else changes we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about that okay can you think of anything else no okay now let me ask you a question have you looked outside at the trees right now most of them are pretty bare right if you if you look very closely you might see some buds on them but as we get closer to spring please jesus come soon um you'll see that the buds then start developing leaves or flowers, right? So that changes. So things change. The seasons change, right? Okay. Everything can change except, guess what? God doesn't change. Pastor Darren's going to share from Malachi today. Malachi 3, 6 says, I, the Lord, do not change. He's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. He loves you no matter what, and he doesn't change. Things around us change, right? Things around us change. We get older. We might gain a little weight. Do you know what I saw? Listen, this is exciting. This is something I hope never changes. You know what I've seen in my yard the past week or two? Big, fat robins. I am so excited. You know what that means. Spring is coming, and we know it's coming, but maybe it's going to come sooner. I really, 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 really hope, but I know that I'm probably not going to get my wish that we don't have a lot more snow so that the robins don't freeze. But boy, is it exciting to see those big old fat robins in my yard. That, that just gives me a great hope for spring. Um, no, robins are not my favorite animal. Probably dogs and kitty cats. And I kind of can't really decide because I've had both. Okay, so, so we need to remember, we change. Things around us, nature changes, the seasons change, everything changes around us, but God never changes. So I want you to remember that, okay? So today, after we have prayer, I have a special little treat for you, and I want to explain it to you. So you guys like Sour Patch Kids? Yes. Yes? Well, <laughs> okay, I usually don't do this, and the parents say thank you every time I don't, but this was perfect for my message today because guess what? I got you the Sour Patch Kids, sorry friends, that change. First, they're sour then they're sweet. So the Sour Patch Kids change, but God never changes. So when you're, when you're chewing on that candy or you're sucking on that candy and you go sour, then sweet, you remember, wow, this is changing, but God never changes. Amen? All right, so shall we pray together? Well, hello, little girls, come on up here. You came at the perfect time because you get a sweet treat. Oh, first sour, then sweet. All right, so you pray. I say, you say. Here we go. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you that although, that although everything, everything around us, around us changes, changes, you don't. You don't. We, love you. we love you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. Come get your sweet and sour treat. Oh, yeah, by the way, 
You'd think if it's so close to Valentine's Day, I'd be able to find little bags, but no, I couldn't. No, I couldn't. So I broke them up, and yes, I wore gloves while I packaged them, I promise. Yes! Would you like one? Yeah. Come here! <laughs> Come here! <gasps> Wait a minute! Happy birthday! You get two. Happy birthday to you. Hey, do you know who this is? Yeah. Who is that? Uh, it's me! It's me! Yeah. yeah. You know who this is? Yeah. That's Pastor Darren. Do you love it? Is it so cute? Yeah. <laughs> Come visit sometime. I'll show you many more pictures of him as a cutie. All right, friends, go to prayer and praise. If you would stand as you are able, we are going to sing, I want a principle within. This is one that we haven't done for a while. <clears throat> it's kind of new to us. It's in our hymnal. But <clears throat> look at the words and watch them. Um, if, you, if you follow along with the uh, hymnal on page 410, it kind of helps you to get where the tune is going to. And so um, let's sing, I want a principle within. <clears throat> <laughs> I want a principle within a watchful godly fear, a sensibility of sin, a pain to fear and near. I want the first approach to fear, the pride or wrong desire, to catch the one. Thank you, Cindy. Well, we're back in the book of Malachi this morning. We're going to be beginning at chapter 3. You know, Jesus reminds us to watch for the times and the seasons. And just like Cheryl mentioned about the changes uh, that we typically notice quite easily in the seasons. Jesus used that same example as we see that. We need to watch what's going on in the world because as we watch and we see these things that are happening, that are going on in the world, we know that Jesus is all the closer to returning. And he also tells us in the scriptures that we need to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Now last week when we talked about uh, the word of God from Malachi, or the word of God that came through Malachi, uh, we ended off with uh, them asking, you know, we were doing the whole uh, question and answer sort of uh, format here. And uh, at the end of chapter two, he said, you have wearied the Lord with your words and yet you ask, how have we wearied him? And which point God says, all who do evil are good in the sight of the Lord. 
and he delights in them, or by asking, where is the God of justice? And so their question was, why is it that good people or why bad people seem to always do so well? You know, where are you, God, in the midst of that? And where is the God of justice in that? Why, are, why do good, good people have bad things happen to them and bad things happen to good people is where they were going in this. And as you recall, uh, God was continually telling him, look, you have fallen away from me but my judgment and my justice will come. It's just not the way you want it to be. So there's a way that God looks at the world. There's a way that we look at the world. And more often than not, the way we look at the world is the way that's convenient for us. Those things that make us feel good. Those things that are easy for us to hear rather than to really listen to, you know, what is God saying? And what is, how does that affect my life? If what I hear is something that I believe, am I also determined to do what he wants? Or do I figure it doesn't apply to me? So let's take a look. So they've been having this conversation going on. And as I told you in chapter 3, we have some good news that comes. But with that good news, there's also some consequence. So let's take a look. So in chapter 3, he says, see... I am sending my messenger to prepare the way for me. I'm sending a messenger to prepare a way for me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. So they were asking, where's God in all of this? Where's justice? Where's the good things that are supposed to be coming? Mind you, you got to remember, they've just spent over 70 years in captivity. Why? Because they were disobedient. They hadn't been doing what God wanted. They hadn't been paying attention. They were doing what made them feel good. They were doing what was comfortable for them. And they justified what they did because even their church leaders, their priests were leading them in these wrong ways. A lot of it dealing with idol worship. So he says, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now we can take this, we need to look at this, I should say, in kind of two ways. Because as it begins, he says, I'm sending a messenger to prepare the way for me. Well, when we think of it from our viewpoint today, who do we think of? Someone say. Who? Jesus? Okay. Anybody else? John the Baptist. So we can look at this and we can see where he's referring to John the Baptist. We can also see where he's referring to Jesus. We have that benefit. We've got that We have an advantage today that the people that first heard this did not know. They had already heard some prophecies about a coming Savior, but they didn't know when it was going to happen. They didn't know who it was. And yet now we know who it was. You'd think now that we know, we would be all the more ready to do whatever it was he asked. Amen? And yet, do we? Do we? The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And here's where we begin to see that shift from John the Baptist to Jesus. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? Who can stand when he appears? If Jesus was to appear before you today, how long do you think you could stay on your feet? How long? I can guarantee you I'd be on my face, flat on the floor, as quick as I could find my way, find my way there. So who could stand when he comes? 
let alone to hear what he's going to say. And if you think about it, <clears throat> in terms of John the Baptist, there, was those, there were those that came to hear, there were those that were curious, there were those that uh, were in awe of what he was doing, there were others who ridiculed him. And he was just the messenger. But many did come. However, when Jesus came, they weren't sure what to do with him. Weren't sure at all. Who could endure the day of his coming to stand in his presence? In Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. And here's John speaking, John the Baptist. I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. When he comes, things are going to happen. And the question is, are we ready? Are we ready for what he brings? After sharing <clears throat> with his followers, uh, after showing, sharing how his followers must partake of his body and blood, this was a conversation Jesus was having. After sharing how he, people would have to partake of the body and of the blood, a reference to what we know as a covenant of communion, of course, they did not understand this at the time. There were many disciples that left Jesus. Are you aware of this happening? That there were those that fell away simply because of what he was saying? In John chapter 6, verse 60 through 69, how many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching, or I should say when many of his disciples heard it, they said this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, he said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. But among you... Among you are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the ones that would betray who was the one that would betray him. And he said, "For this reason I have told you that no one comes to me unless it is, unless it is granted by the Father." So now in a practical way how this works is God sends the Holy Spirit to call and tug on people's hearts. And so as he's drawing them to Jesus, Jesus then reveals himself. And then, of course, Jesus points to who? The Father. But God, through the Spirit, draws us to Jesus. Jesus draws us to God. And that's a lot for us to be able to deal with. And of course, when Jesus deals us to him, when the Holy Spirit is drawing us to Jesus, he's also telling us to look where? He's telling us to look in our hearts and to do what? To repent of our sins. And how many of us love doing that? We've got more excuses for the things that we've got than we've got confessions for what we're doing. And this is why it's hard for people to hear about Jesus. They don't mind hearing about God. They don't mind hearing about love because they can, they can imagine in their life God as being almost anything they want. But because of Jesus, a particular person brought to us by a particular God at a particular time to do a particular thing for us requires us to acknowledge our sin, to repent and accept Jesus because he is the way, the truth, the life, and the only way to get to God. For this reason, he said in verse 65, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this then, because of Jesus, 
many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So should we be surprised today when people hear about Jesus, they read about him, they hear about the things he's done, they see the evidence of God in the lives of people around him who have experienced his presence and his power, and they still say no, and they walk away because it's too much. It's too much. Because of this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus then asked the 12, do you also wish to go away? Imagine Jesus asking you that question. Do you also wish to go away? And Simon Peter answered him, and I pray this is always our answer. Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words to eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. No matter what else happens, no matter what else we experience, we know you are the Holy One of God. And if we can get to that moment and that place in our heart, then after that, it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter if the road is difficult. It doesn't matter if it's not easy and comfortable. If you've ever found yourself uncomfortable about your faith, if you've ever found yourself uncomfortable about living for Jesus, if you've ever felt that, well, everything around me is not exactly the way I like it so that I'm exactly comfortable the way it is, ask yourself this, is, is, it, is it as uncomfortable as being nailed to a cross and hanging there until you die? Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like the refiner's fire and like the fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Remember that was also part of the problem in their day is that the priests were not following God's will, and we're doing things in regards to worship that they weren't supposed to. But that same process applies to all believers. Jesus refines us. And he refines us through the trials and tribulations that we experience. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, by his great mercy. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, if you thought you've experienced difficult things in your life, if you've gone through those tests of your faith and you thought, wow, that was difficult, imagine trying to go through the things of this world and not having God's protection and power in your life to help us. In this you rejoice, he says in verse 6. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, though is perishable, is tested by fire. May be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The 
the tests of fire in our faith. How many stories could we tell of our faith being tested in the fires of life? That at some point we wondered, why is this happening? Or even looking to God and say, Lord, why are you doing this to me? And when it isn't God doing it to me. There was a moment at one appointment I had when... I was being persecuted by people in the church relentlessly and over nothing. Beaten over and over again verbally and emotionally. In a town that said, hey, we're glad you're here to the congregation going, or at least part of them going, why are you here? Who even called you here? To the point where I was just exhausted emotionally. And at one point I found myself in the sanctuary weeping, crying. And I actually asked God this question. Why do you hate me? I was that broken, that hurt. This close to giving up. but I knew he loved me. And I knew that somehow, somewhere, some way, the torture would end. And eventually it did. We were at that church for 10 months. And God delivered us out of that into a place that held us and nurtured us and loved us and through God healed us. And in all of that, repenting of my stupid question, but I also wondered why. And one day God revealed to me why. And it was simple. He says, Darren, it's because I know you can get through this. I wasn't so sure. And then it dawned on me. Somebody was going to have to do this. But because of our time there, what was going on in that church was fully revealed to the powers that be. And they began to understand the dynamics of what was going on in that church. And then it was, it was better that I could go and do it so that no one else had to. And so for that, I gave God praise. And he also revealed to me at another time, not long after that, I was using this for many things, and one was to help refine me, to make me stronger, to make me better as a pastor and as a husband and as a father and as a man of God. And would prepare me ultimately for where we are today. My journey here was difficult at times. But that refiner's fire tests our faith to strengthen us and equip us. But we have to have the strength and the power to go through it. And thank God it doesn't have to be our strength and our power. All we have to do is just be willing to endure. Consider the command of the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. Therefore I counsel to you, to buy from me, to buy from God gold refined by fire so that you can be rich 
and white robes to clothe you and to keep you, keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Therefore, be earnest and repent. Never underestimate what you will gain from the things you suffer. So back to chapter 3. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing, he said. So when the, uh, the Levites bring that pleasing offering, when they've gotten their lives right with the Lord, they can bring this offering that's pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old in their former years. Verse 5, then I will draw you near I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be swift to bear witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired workers in their wages, the widow and the orphan, against those who thrust aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. And so when he comes, there will be a reckoning, there will be a judgment for those who have turned away from God and have turned against their fellow people. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, have not perished. I have saved you thus far, he's saying, in spite of the things that have gone on. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have turned aside from my statues and you have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? So again, there's a lot of doubt in their minds. And this is how he reminds them of one of the ways they've gone astray. Verse 8, will anyone rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But then you say, well, how are we robbing you? And he touched on this in the first couple of chapters as well, if you recall. And this was his answer, in your tithes and in your offerings. You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. That there may be food in my house and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. Here's the one way God says, yes, you can test me. Bring the whole offering in. I'll make sure you're taken care of. I can handle that. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. I will rebuke the locust for you so that it will not destroy the produce of your soil and your vine in the field shall not be barren, says the Lord. Then all nations will count you happy for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. You have spoken harsh words against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What do we profit by keeping his command or going about as mourners before the Lord of hosts? Remember, we were talking about times and seasons. And how many people around us, well, why do I need to go to church? Why do I need to bother going to a Sunday school class? Why should I pray? Why should I do that? Nothing's going on. I know thousands of people in this world that don't pray, don't go to God, and they're some of the most rich and powerful people in the world. What's the point? I've got other things to do on Sunday morning. Why do I want to go in there and sit with other people that don't actually believe in God anyway? Why do I want to go sit with a bunch of hypocrites? Why do I want to go in there and have people that are going to treat me nicely? Or why do I want to go to a church where people are so busy arguing with themselves over stupid things? Now, most of you have probably never experienced this in your years in the church. But literally, and I've said this before, when folks get into a heaping argument and split the church, and I think maybe I've shared this one with you. There was a church in a town in Indiana years ago. Not, uh, it, was a, an, uh, it wasn't a Methodist church. But it was a new church build, and they got into a, 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 dis, a, a discussion about one group said, you know, we should start having a Bible study. 
And another group literally said, why do we need to have a Bible study? We have church after all. They split. The one half that wanted to have a Bible study, they started another. Let alone the ones that fight about what color the carpet is, where the pews are, what music's being played, what color of paint's on the wall, and who moved the picture of Jesus. They argue about these things like life in heaven is going to change because of any one of them. And it doesn't matter. God does not care what color your carpet is, what kind of music you play. What he wants to know is where is your heart? Where is our heart? Mm, 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 mm. How are we robbing you? See if I will not pour out these blessings upon you. How have we spoken against you? Hmm. You have said it is vain to serve God. Verse 15, now we count the arrogant happy. Evildoers not only prosper, but when they put God to the test, they escape. Now we've talked about this already. Then those who revered the Lord, there are those in, in this uh, time, who were faithful, there's a remnant that are listening, there's a remnant that's paying attention. Hopefully we have a remnant here as well, and more than that. Those who revered the Lord spoke with one another, and the Lord took note and listened. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who revered the Lord and thought on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, my special possession on the day when I act, and I will spare them as parents spare their children who serve them. Then once more you shall see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve God. God will make the distinction. God will separate the sheep from the goats. Question is, do we want to be the sheep? Do we want to be the goat? Chapter 4, see the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and the evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 21, 4. This is the final judgment described there. And then I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it, the earth and the heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened. Also another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in, it, in them. And all were judged according to what they had done. The day will come when all will pay for what they have done one way or another. There will be a reckoning. There will be a judgment. So we don't have to worry about who may or may not be getting away with whatever it is that's happened or is happening. Verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the eternal death. The first is that of the body. The second is that of the spirit. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. 
They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. The time of healing eternally for those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, those who stay faithful to God, those who even though they see the times and seasons of things coming, knowing that every day, every breath, every minute brings us that closer when he returns like a thief in the night. But we're ready and we're awake and being about his business You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall and you shall tread down the wicked for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the teaching of my servant Moses and the statutes and ordinances I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Remember God's commandments, he's telling them. Remember to love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. To follow his will and not our own. Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And so he mentions the messenger once more. The one who would prepare, the one who would be the message. John the Baptist never considered himself to be Elijah. He was even specifically asked at one time, are you the prophet Elijah? And he said, no. But in Matthew chapter 11, verse 13 and 14, Jesus had something entirely different to say. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John came. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. And so Jesus And John the Baptist fulfilled the prophecy of Malachi. And he said, when this this prophet comes, verse 6 tells us, he will turn the hearts of parents to their children, the hearts of children to their parents, so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. The day of his return, is soon. Jesus himself said it was soon and we are that much closer to to it today. And we've seen even in the churches well that which is called sin by God is called good by people. And that which is good by God is called evil again by those within the church throughout the world. The lies of the enemy are being taught and the people are buying it. And why do people buy it? Because it feels good. It's easy to accept sin rather than to accept righteousness. Because righteousness requires us to adjust our behavior. Sin requires us to indulge whatever we want. And God said, no, that is not the way. That is not the truth. And that will not bring you life. So we must hold on to that which he taught us and to live it fully knowing that we are getting closer. The times and seasons are changing more rapidly every day. And we are getting closer and closer to that moment. And when he returns as that thief in the night, will he find us ready? Will he find us doing his work? Or or will he find us indulging our own desires, our own will, those things that are comfortable for us? These are questions we each have to answer individually and then live out. Wherever we go, whatever we're doing, Whatever job is, whatever our school is, whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, 
Are we living up to what God has set for us? Are we living to his standards or the world's? The message has been delivered. The messenger has already come. And the one who is the message will return. Are you ready? Let's pray. Gracious God, in you, there is life. You are the way, the truth, the life, and the only way to get to God. And you have called us to love you with our heart, with our soul, with our strength to stay focused on you, to be aware of what's going on around us, to not be so self-absorbed in our own desires that we forget about what it is you've called us to do, to share the good news, to help those who are in need, to help feed and clothe and visit and heal all who are in need. Because there has been a moment in each of our life right here when we were the one in need. We were the one that needed healing. We were the one that needed salvation. And somewhere along the line, God provided someone to share that good news with us. Somewhere along the line, God shared with, with us through somebody who would hold our hand and pray and would guide us in our prayer to repent of our sins. Somewhere along the line, God sent somebody into our life to say, hey, this isn't what it is to follow God. And so in love, they rebuked us and helped set us on that straight and narrow path. And by your grace, we were able to receive it. By your power, we were able to overcome the obstacles in our lives. But it can't stop there. It has to continue. We have to continue to grow. We have to continue to challenge ourselves. We have to continue to, our, to challenge and, and lift up and support our family members and our neighbors and those around us, the stranger alike that we can all grow closer in our faith. The day is coming and is even here where there are many who don't want to hear the truth. But we know the truth sets us free. And we know that refining fire of God, as difficult as it is at times to endure, will make us stronger, will make us more faithful and better equipped to be his servants. But what will we do? Will we take the easy route? Are we looking for times when it's just fun? Or are we looking for those times when we really get down and dig into your word and into its meaning and into its repre? Uh, how it impacts our lives, the repercussions for our lives, and then do something with it to be more than just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. There's all kinds of demands on our time, and we allow all sorts of demands upon our time. But Jesus took time out of his eternal life to become a human, to become a person in the flesh. Why? Because he thought it would be a vacation? Because he thought it might be fun? No. He did it for us. He came to live this life and to die, to be that perfect sacrifice so that we could be forgiven of our sins and can be restored into the family of God. No greater gift has ever been given. 
May we use that gift and live a life worthy of the calling God has upon our lives. So, Father, right now in the name of Jesus Christ, where we have fallen short, forgive us. Where we have doubted, when we have even questioned you, forgive us, O Lord. And we thank you for those moments of refining, as difficult and as painful as they were. You have strengthened and equipped us, Lord, in ways we could never imagine. And Lord, we thank you for that next person that we're going to meet that we can pray for. We thank you, Father, for that next person we can help introduce your word to. We thank you, Lord, for that next opportunity when we can gather with other believers and pray together and to look into your word, to grow in our faith, to take responsibility for our faith and say, I want to learn, so I'm going to look, I'm going to read, and I'm going to invite others to join me in that journey. There are those moments, Lord, when we're hungry. And I can remember as a child and as a young adult, a youth, and saying, Mom, I'm hungry. And she said, you know, you're old enough. You can make something to eat. You know where the refrigerator is. Lord, we're old enough to know where to go to eat. And sometimes it's not about who's going to feed us, but it's about what am I going to do to feed myself? by your power, by your strength, by your word. And so, Lord, where we have fallen short, forgive us in the name of Jesus Christ. We do love you. We do thank you. And, Lord, we do earnestly want to grow. So reveal to us what is next and how we can be a part of somebody else's journey. And we thank you for those who are a part of ours. And together, may we be the body of Christ, the bride adorned for eternity with you. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Let us rise as you are able, as we sing softly and tenderly.
God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you, equip you, and be with you now and forevermore. Amen and amen.